Hi, I'm Suzanne Clark, President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm delighted to welcome you here today. The Chamber's Global Innovation Policy Center is delighted to host a really important discussion in conjunction with the National Endowment for the Arts, Americans for the Arts, and the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Today, you'll hear from an exceptional group of artists and experts who will share their insights on the important contributions of arts and entertainment to our society. Anyone who has been moved by a work of art, a song, a film, or a great novel understands how the arts define who we are, celebrate our humanity, and enrich our lives. At the same time, the arts are a significant part of our economy, creating millions of jobs and providing value to countless consumers. Arts and entertainment have helped so many people get through moments of social isolation this year, but sadly, these sectors have suffered serious negative economic impacts during this challenging time. To discuss these issues and more, we're honored to be joined by two immensely talented and accomplished women, award-winning actress Annette Benning and National Endowment for the Arts Chairman Mary Ann Carter. So I'm delighted to have these talented women with us today, and I want to start by saying a lot of people have a passion for the arts, but few people are able to turn it into a profession. And maybe Annette, starting with you, what led you to make this your life's work and why are the arts so important to you? Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be on the forum with you today. Well, let's see. I suspect that one thing that unites all of us who work in arts advocacy is an early experience of total imaginative immersion. I'll describe mine briefly. When I was in the ninth grade, my English teacher took us all on a field trip to the Old Globe Theater in San Diego to see a Shakespeare play, The Merchant of Venice. And it blew my mind. The play has pathos, romance, comedy, it explores racism, social justice, and prejudice, but I was just dazzled. I loved the sounds of the actors' voices, their fierceness, their passion, the sweat on their faces, the commitment to the moment, how funny they were, and how touched I felt at the immediacy of the experience. I knew on some level that this was a rigorous intellectual play of ideas, but these were ideas. It was the way they were being played out in this emotionally charged way, which is, of course, the essence of dramatic art. I certainly didn't understand everything that they were saying, but I knew in my gut that I knew what they meant. And I think for most of us, certainly, who are participating in this forum today, in whatever area of, of expertise they have, this kind of immersion has happened you know, playing music or seeing a dance performance, taking a trip to a museum and being arrested by a painting or a piece of sculpture or curled up reading a book, that feeling of being taken out of oneself and yet closer to oneself is the essence of why art is so crucial. To awaken this possibility young young people is what arts education is all about because once you felt it, it becomes a part of what is normal it's a way to lift oneself up and to integrate oneself on a daily basis. I remember when I first started doing arts advocacy work, I was stymied because the value of the arts was to me so obvious that I had a hard time communicating its importance. It's like asking a fish to describe water. Art expresses the inexpressible. It tells us the secret that we didn't know we already knew. Its nature is to take what is ineffable and to offer it up as experience. It's fundamental to our humanity. It enlightens, enlivens, and delights us. But it's also there to help us to acknowledge ambiguity and paradox and pain. It helps us to grieve, just to experience what it is to be human. It's an essential part of a healthy community and strengthens us socially, economically, and educationally. Many others today are experts on the role that arts plays in our economy, and they will speak to that. But one big statistic that I can throw out is that the creative sector employs 5.1 million people, earning a total of $405 billion a year. We're talking not-for-profit and for-profit creative industries, employing artists, educators, entrepreneurs, vendors, policymakers, and funders. A broad range of jobs spanning many disciplines like performance, what I do, in film, TV, or theaters, dance, music, design, visual art, digital work, 
That is websites, gaming, augmented and virtual reality, crafting, writing, and more. For me, Suzanne, this work is a way of continuing to say thank you. So thank you, and thanks for including me today. Oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. I'm so struck by this idea. I wrote it down of getting out of oneself and yet closer to oneself. I'm really struck by that. Thank you for that insight. Thanks. So, so Marianne, we're talking about how you chose this profession, why the arts are so important to you. How do you answer that question? Well, I come very late to the game. Um, it's a nice segue from Annette because I'm sort of the person she was describing when you said, you know, how, how does art affect you? Um, I, I really became involved when my daughter was seven years old and she was diagnosed with dyslexia. And we knew a traditional classroom environment wasn't gonna be successful for her. So I started looking around for a school where she could be academically successful. And I found a school um, where they integrate the arts into the teaching method. And so I'm always clear to say it's not a performing arts school. The arts is actually what is utilized to teach. And so here I am nine years later, my daughter's in 10th grade, she gets straight A's. And it is all because there were teachers out there who could teach her differently because she learns differently. And as I have gone through this, through the years watching my daughter gain confidence and become successful in school, I realized this teaching, the integration of the arts into the way we teach should be a part of every child's education, which is also glad, uh, which is also why I'm glad and mentioned arts education. So having seen and witnessed this within my own family, what I realized was arts is not a luxury. It's a fundamental part of our everyday life. It certainly is in my household. Well, we're going to have to talk offline about my ninth grader and your 10th grader and the, the challenges of raising these girls in a pandemic. But that'll be a different conversation. And certainly the arts are playing a big role. While you have the microphone, Marianne, maybe you could talk for just a second about how you would describe both the social and economic contributions of the creative economy. So, of course, socially, we know that the arts are a uniter they bring communities together they build bridges they promote tolerance they give us the ability to see beyond ourselves and to see differences that unite us not divide us and of course arts organizations within our cities and towns have always been uh, places for celebration they've been places for solace and reflection at times. They have opened their doors to first responders when needed. And so just like the Chamber of Commerce unites the business community, our arts organizations unite the entire community. But they are also economic engines for our cities and towns. The arts bring in $877 billion to the U.S. economy. That's 4.5% of our GDP. That is more than warehousing and manufacturing combined. It's more than construction. It's more than agriculture. And so by making sure that our cities and towns, working with our chambers and other community activists, keep the arts alive and well, that's what's going to keep our communities live and well. And that's what we need right now, especially. Almost every community is going to need some kind of economic recovery. And the arts can and should be a part of that economic recovery. 
I think that's right. And that linkage between business and the arts and communities is just so important. And so, and that turning to you, as you think about the same question, the social and economic contributions of the creative economy, but also the artists and creative workers who make it possible. What do you think about? Thank you, Marianne, for what you said so eloquently. I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all of the work that you've done uh, during your time at the National Endowment. Thank you for that. Well, of course, right now, what we're experiencing is the losses because they have been seismic. The arts and the live events in particular were the first to close and will be the last to reopen. Um, there was a recent survey done with mayors to look at the social, public health, and economic impacts of COVID on our cities. And more than half of the may mayors placed arts and cultural institutions in the eventually or never returning to normal categories. This has decimated our community. We have suffered billions in losses with a ripple effect on audience spending at local businesses, parking garages, restaurants. 95% of artists and creative workers have lost income with 63% remaining unemployed nationwide. And of course, as we know, those numbers are higher among people of color, black, indigenous people and, and those communities. And this is all according to the uh, Americans for the Artists, Americans for the Arts Artists Survey. Many artists, including myself, although I don't usually call myself an artist, I would just say an actress. But anyway, many people, including myself and friends at the Actors Fund, the Actors Fund being an entertainment community fund, which helps people in the performing arts behind the curtain, in front of the curtain, behind the camera, in front of the camera. It's for everybody in entertainment, but it's called the Actors Fund. And uh, We've appeared doing virtual benefits, concerts to help raise money to support healthcare initiatives, art causes and organizations that are suffering hardships. Um, of course, as we all know, because we've watched so many of these, artists are also lend their time and talents to perform and produce products that help the public to combat isolation raise morale and empower people during this time. Stars in the House is an example, just one of many, many. It's a show that's done daily on YouTube by Seth Rodetsky and James Wesley from their apartment in New York to benefit people in the performing arts all over the country. And they have people watching from all over the world and they uh, you could watch and contribute to the Actors Fund that way. Um, and the Actors Fund has been amazing in terms of being able to directly help people with financial aid. Also, artists have been able to use their skills uh, as critical advocates for voting, for voter registration, and political and social justice initiatives like Black Lives Matter, for instance. Mm -hmm. And funds have been created like the Actors Fund, Emergency Relief, Artist Relief, Music Cares, and many more, as I'm sure Marianne is very expert in, to help uh, offset the financial losses to this community. But these funds cannot keep up with the demand, and much more is needed, of course. Well, I think you're so, well, I certainly consider you an artist. I think we all consider you an artist, yeah. but I think the, What's so important about what you're saying, and it does build on what Marianne said, which is that this is a community, right? The people in front of the curtain, the people behind the curtain, the people coming to watch. But I loved your reference to all the, you know, ripple effects on businesses like parking garages and, and cafeterias and, and fine dining. You know, it's, it's, it's just a really remarkable time for a lot of these small businesses. And I really appreciate you bringing that ecosystem into the conversation. Marianne, as you think about um, and maybe maybe we won't ask Annette to comment on this because it would be unfair, but as you think about artists and creative workers themselves, how have they been impacted during this pandemic? Well, of course, the biggest um, impact has been financial and um, it really has been devastating. Um, all the statistics that Annette just went through, they're probably even worse than that. Um, you know, th this is just what what people uh, report. 
and uh, it has just been it has been so detrimental but it's also detrimental to society in ways that people don't aren't seeing and so for example we fund uh, organizations who go and work um, on arts programming in our prisons and it has done miraculous work i actually went to san quentin um, and was able to view this in person but the idea is we are giving a skill so when these incarcerated individuals get out they have a skill to go follow and to do something and that impact is really important for society as a whole because what we don't want are any of those individuals to end up back in prison and think about our kids who uh, right now are, are trying and struggling to learn virtually they're not getting that hands-on arts experience or they're not getting their music lessons um, in person or their singing lessons or whatever art they might pursue. My own daughter dances and dancing over Zoom is definitely not the same as dancing in the studio. And so, so what loss to our children are we seeing? I talk about um, the elderly who are in assisted living facilities or memory care facilities who are already so isolated just by um, the virtue of their circumstances, yet we fund artists to go in and creatively work with them and give them things to do and let them unleash their minds, even if for a short time. Those people can't go in and help those already isolated. Imagine how isolated they are right now. And so, and, and the artists feel that. So yes, they have been so financially hit, but they also understand that the work that they do that changes society and makes society better is not in play right now. And that's gonna have detrimental effects down the road. And we really need to um, think about that as a society. And I really wanna thank Annette for all of her work with the Actors Fund. Um, I actually did Stars in the House. Um, I did a show with them as well. And the show was concentrated on the CARES Act. And uh, we were able to provide uh, directly or indirectly some financial support to more than 5,000 organizations. But as Annette said, there is so much more needed and we all are in this together. So we actually all have to work together um, no matter what industry you're in, because if we are going to pull ourselves out of this economic morass that we find ourselves in right now, we really are all going to have to work together. So let me wrap this up by asking you both kind of a lightning round question, if I might. And uh, Annette, let me start with you. Is there a particular genre you find yourself turning to right now for comfort or solace? Do you find yourself reading more or listening to more music or watching more films? What's bringing you particular comfort or joy right now? I have to say reading for me has probably brought me the most solace. And I just finished a great novel. I think it's the best novel I've ever read. I just read Middlemarch by George Eliot, which I'd never read. And I felt like this woman has explained everything to me about the universe that I never understood. <laughs> it's been so joyous and moving to me to have this experience. So I would say reading would be the top of my list. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Now, of course, we're all gonna rush out and read Middlemarch. <laughs> Uh, I just reread The Gentleman from Moscow because I felt like I wanted to be some kind of touch point. I missed the count, I think, when I'm not reading. <laughs> Marianne, let, let me ask, uh, Marianne, let me ask you a, a similar kind of lightning round question, which is if you could get one message out there, just one message to people uh, watching today, and it might be a less traditional audience than you usually reach, what would you want the business community to know about the arts? I guess I would want the business community to understand what the economic impact of the art sector is on their communities. And um, Suzanne, um, 
in, in lieu of bragging just a little bit about the agency on our website at arts.gov, we actually have state uh, statistics, state data uh, for all about the arts in a state. So for example, you could pull down California or Virginia where you are, and it will list the number of artists in your state, the wages and benefits in that state, where our presence in, in your state. And not only people just across the nation, but especially elected officials are constantly surprised about the numbers that we show. We all know art is beautiful. We all know none of us, none of us could have made it through this pandemic without a book or TV or movies or music uh, or online performances. And so, so now I'm hoping that at least people understand the value of the arts in your life and making your life more enjoyable. But I still don't think people understand the economic impact. And that is a really important message to get across. So for the business community in particular, I think that is what I would stress. Well, I can't thank you both enough for doing this. It, it always reminds me, I wanna run out and listen and dance and sing and read and watch just, uh, just listening to you, you're so inspiring. And I think spreading the message of what it takes to have a healthy, vibrant arts you know, exist in the United States is really important work. And I'm grateful to you both for being willing to spend time with us today and spread that message. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Annette, so good to see you. Thank you very much, Suzanne and Marianne, once again, to be with you. I, I really have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, welcome. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Suzanne, Annette, and Chairman Carter just now. I'm Sunil Lyngar, Director of Research and Analysis of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm joined here by Michael Seaman, an Assistant Professor of Arts Management at Colorado State University, with particular expertise in the fields of music, entrepreneurship, and economic development. I'm also joined by Randy Cohen, VP of Research at Americans for the Arts, which is also a co-sponsor of this event. As you heard in the last session, uh, there are quite a few numbers out there attesting to the outsized economic footprint of the arts in everyday life. I'm going to try to unpack some of those numbers for you just now and then share the economic outlook for arts industries, artists, and arts workers based solely on federal data. After that, I'll turn to Michael and Randy for their own perspectives based on numbers from the private sector. And finally, we'll talk about prospects for recovery and factors we believe will contribute to the overall resilience of arts businesses. So first, let me raise a few points about the arts and cultural sector as a whole. Um, according to our federal partner, the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Department of Commerce, the arts contribute over $877 billion to the economy. You heard Chairman Carter say that, and also Annette uh, referred to some of these statistics. That's 4.5% of gross domestic product. It's a higher amount than the value added by such diverse sectors as construction, transportation, utilities, mining, and agriculture, just to take a few. Prior to the pandemic, arts and cultural industries employed 5.1 million workers with total compensation exceeding $400 billion. Another thing to know about the sector is that before COVID-19, it had been on a fast growth trajectory, expanding at twice the rate of the US economy overall. The highest growth industry in the sector is web streaming and web publishing. Uh, that's unlikely to change soon. It seems unlikely, to, uh, but also in the mix, I would say prior to COVID, were theatrical ticketing, arts-related construction, and sound recording, among many other growth industries. Another thing, historically, the sector yields trade surplus for the U.S., exporting about $30 billion more in arts and cultural goods and services than we import. What kinds of industries as a whole make up arts and culture? In addition to those I've already named, there's uh, broadcasting, movies, publishing, arts retail trade, and of course, museums, and many, many others. But there's also performing arts companies and what are called independent artists, writers, and performers, which alone generate around $52 billion of US GDP. Now, I know most of you don't uh, think of dollar signs when you think of the arts. And on balance, it's probably a good thing. 
still, you can see how big the sector is and how much weight it pulls for the overall economy. Yet, what people don't often realize is how disproportionately and acutely vulnerable are arts workers, artists, and entertainers right now. We're the very backbone of these industries. Recently, our friends at FEMA got wind of the, how severe this impact is. Because they recognize the importance of the sector to the overall economy and its recovery, FEMA officials partnered with us on an analysis that's just been posted to our website at arts.gov. There are lots of charts and tables there, but I'll just share a few highlights. One, among performing arts businesses alone, the number of workers on payroll fell by half from January to October 2020. That's workers on payroll, but as you know, artists are at the forefront of the gig economy. They are more than three times as likely as other workers to be self-employed. In fact, looking at the performing arts, we know that at the start of the fall of 2020, the unemployment rate for dancers and choreographers was over 54%. That compares with 8.5% unemployment for all workers. For actors, it was 52%. For workers whose main job was as a musician, it was 27%. Another especially vulnerable segment is the nonprofit arts sector, which has seen declines in both earned and contributed income. That's less giving and also less box office revenue. Among nonprofit performing arts organizations alone, revenue dipped by more than 70% from the third quarter of 2019 to the same period in 2020. So much of this, of course, is a hit to the demand side of the equation. The sheer volume of consumer spending on performing arts tickets has dropped fourfold roughly since the pandemic began because of stay-at-home orders, caps on attendance, and people's general inclination not to venture out during the pandemic. Add to that the fixed costs of many arts institutions and new expenses to comply with safety protocols. I want to end by saying that while I've spent all this time talking about the economic implications of the pandemic, we need to reflect on the consequences for social and civic engagement and the arts contributions to healing and recovery, especially in such trying times as these. From other national surveys, we know that the leading motivation for going out to attend live arts events is so people can socialize and be with family and friends. We also know that arts participants are more likely than other workers to volunteer in their communities or do charity work. We know how vital arts education can be in nurturing social and emotional development and creativity. In short, we risk forfeiting other spillover benefits, not just economic ones, when we permit the sector to fall. So Michael, uh, I'll turn to you first. Uh, I've painted a pretty stark picture. But I haven't talked about the hit to our nation's creative outlook. Last year, you did your own study with the economist Richard Florida. It's called Lost Art. Can you tell us what you meant by that title? Sure, Sunil, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, the initial impacts of the COVID-19 crisis was uh, devastating to the arts and the creative economy. Uh, in March of 2020, Richard, Florida, and I uh, decided we want to see if we could quantify what this impact would be. We knew it would be, would be very, uh, it would be enormous, but we didn't quite know how large because this is something we haven't seen before. Uh, through using data from EMSI and bunch of other different uh, sources, uh, we started to analyze how uh, how significant this, this hit would be. And we, we came up with the estimation of uh, basically between April 1st and July 31st, we would lose about 2.7 million jobs and about 157 billion in sales of goods and services. And that's over 111 industries within nine clusters that make up the creative economy. Uh, clusters like advertising and design, film and television, fashion. And keep in mind, uh, these jobs included people that are laid off or furloughed temporary, permanently. Uh, some people lost their jobs entirely. You have musicians that lost tours and multiple gigs. Uh, you had filmmakers that had to push off entire films, Broadway actors that suddenly had nowhere to act. Uh, so in time, some of these jobs will definitely come back. But one thing that we found was uh, incredibly uh, important is the impact that the fine and performing arts uh, received. Basically, we found that about half of those 2.7 million jobs were in the fine and performing arts. Uh, and that represented about 40, 42 billion uh, lost in sales and revenue. And the other thing to think of is keep in mind that Many people in uh, the creative economy and the arts have several jobs. Uh, it's not uncommon for one person to work in film, to work in music, and to also uh, perhaps work in theater. So this combined with loss of jobs and other uh, elements of uh, the economy, such as uh, food service and such, uh, it really is a, a crisis situation. 
An interesting point we did find, though, uh, is how this played out geographically. You know, usually you think, well, the creative economy, the arts, it's a big city thing. It's a big city on the coast, Los Angeles, New York, uh, the third coast, Chicago. What we found is when, yes, uh, in terms of the size of the numbers, definitely New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, that really were leading the pack. But when we looked at the size of uh, the concentration, uh, the percentage of the creative economy, smaller places really uh, stood out, uh, whether it's cities or states like Las Vegas, Orlando, Vermont, Nevada, uh, Minneapolis. Uh, these were actually hit harder than some of the bigger cities. And it really leads you to you know, art and creative economy. It's everywhere. It's rural, it's urban. And it's not just a big city thing, it's a United States thing. That's great. Um, thank you for that information. Uh, it's sobering, of course. Uh, turning to you, Randy, uh, what have you found in your own research about the toll of the pandemic on arts organizations? But I, I guess I'd like you to talk a little bit about on artists and arts and creative workers, too, what the toll has been, especially yeah. maybe those from historically disadvantaged backgrounds. Sure. Thanks, Sunil. And, and hi, everyone. Great to be with you today. Um, uh, since mid-March, when the pandemic really took hold in this country, uh, we've been surveying artists and uh, nonprofit arts organizations, close to 30,000 artists uh, and about 20,000 nonprofit arts organizations on, on the human and the financial impacts. And um, yeah, you've been hearing, it's it's brutal. And uh, But uh, certainly what we've found is that uh, virtually every uh, arts organization out there has had to cancel events, uh, cancel exhibitions. Um, and that's resulted in 484 million lost admissions, we estimate. And you can put that into a dollars and cents piece as well, you know, $14.8 billion in lost income uh, for these arts organizations. And, you know, they've been finding ways to cope with it. A third of them have had to uh, reduce or furlough staff. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, over half of them are, are still closed. Uh, and some have, you know, reopened and, and closed. And um, the biggest area are, you know, barriers to reopening. And this is this is the big thing, right? If you, if you can't open, um, you know, how, how are you going to do business? How are you going to serve the community? But um, what worries people is customers unlikely to attend, um, government restrictions, uh, and um, just the organizations don't feel it's safe yet for audiences and for the artists. It's just impractical to produce. So um, no surprise then 10% of organizations uh, have seen major doubts that they'll see the other side of this pandemic. On the other um, side, on the artist side, uh, over 60% are fully unemployed uh, as a result of this. 79% um, have lost work uh, and income, or 95% um, have lost work. Uh, so, and if you put that to a, you know, a dollars and cents, they average a $21,500 a year loss uh, in creative income. And um, to your question about uh, uh, black indigenous artists of color, um, they've they've seen it uh, a harder time than um, uh, than white artists. They see higher unemployment rates and they expect to lose a larger share uh, of their income uh, in 2020 and again in 2021. So very challenging times for the artists and the organizations themselves. Thank you, Randy. Um, so I know for those out here, out there who are hearing a lot of gloom and doom, um, just wanted to point out that we, we've had some conversations and there are you know certainly some clouds we would we hope are starting to part. Uh, let me just mention a few signs, a few good signs, and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, as many know, there was a $15 billion cash infusion through appropriations signed into law a few weeks ago that would support operators of live arts and entertainment venues, cinemas and museums, for example. We also know that many arts organizations excel at lo local community development, uh, sorry, local community engagement, and have benefited from strong community partnerships, donors and audience bases to help them get through some of these lean times. Uh, meanwhile, among arts organizations that have managed to reopen successfully, they found innovative ways to monetize virtual arts experiences while reaching broader groups than they might have reached before. Um, there's even been uh, reported growth in book sales and music streaming. Marianne uh, a while ago mentioned uh, that those forms of art. 
uh, in 2020. Um, so those are just some of the things that are on the positive side of the ledger. Ledger, and of course, we're looking for them all the time. Uh, so what other bright spots do you see, uh, Michael, on your end? Yes. Uh, demography is destiny. Uh, right now, you have just over 50% of the country are either in the millennial generation or Generation Z. Uh, and that is uh, rather large. So the, the other biggest generation is the boomers. Uh, that was about 68 million. There are 82 million uh, millennials and about 86 million in Generation Z. So from age one to about age 38. And they, before the pandemic, we're driving what is called the experience economy. Basically, uh, the spending trends are much more about experiences, live events, and not just items. Uh, and you could see this with things like Coachella, you know, going to two weekends. You had the rise of experienced places like Meow Wolf, that's uh, an experienced immersive art uh, um, situation that's in Santa Fe, now Denver, Las Vegas. Uh, you have Art Tech House in Miami, a place, too, where you experience art. Uh, this was the growing trend before the pandemic. At the same time, the creative economy was really doing quite well. It was very robust. Uh, then the switch got turned off, but this hasn't changed. These people are still here. It is the dominant um, trend and uh, portion of our economy in terms of age and, and spending patterns. I would say once we can figure out how to open uh, safely and effectively, we're not going to see the roaring 20s. We'll see the screaming 20s uh, with the amount of buying and performing arts events that uh, will be attended, ones will be hosted, ones will be thrown. It's just a matter of timing. Yeah, and uh, I would love that, the screaming 20s, let's hope. Um, and you, you were saying, as you were saying, the arts economy had been flourishing and is indeed on a, was indeed on a growth trajectory just before this. So let's hope that stay, stays true. Um, so Randy, bright spots. Yeah, well, I think the research clearly underscores the screaming economy. Um, that's fabulous, Michael. Um, you know, look, when we get to the other side of this pandemic, and we're not sure when it is, but there will be another side, there's two big areas uh, that are going to be priorities. How do we jumpstart the economy? And how do we reunify our communities? And the arts are going to be central to both of those. Every time somebody goes out to an arts event, Annette uh, Benning touched on this earlier, Every time someone goes to a performance, an exhibition, a festival, they average $31.47 per person per event, not including the cost of admission on spending related to that, parking, a meal, babysitting. Um, so there's lots of activity every time somebody goes to an arts. Those are dollars going to local merchants. So the arts, they get us out of our homes, into the community, going to local businesses. 70% of the you know, nation's economy is consumer spending. So this is fueling that. And then the flip side of that, which is equally important, I mean, there's been such challenging times socially and isolation and loneliness and quarantining. Um, how do we reconnect our communities? Again, that's the arts. The arts get us out of our homes in, in the, their shared experiences in public spaces. And the public gets this as well, uh, Sunil. 72% of the American public says the arts unify our communities, regardless of age, race, or ethnicity. 73%, the arts help me understand other cultures in my community. So when we need to think about how do we jumpstart the economy, how do we get our communities back together, uh, sharing experiences, operating in a more unified way, Way, that's the arts. And you know, the bottom line, the arts aren't just nice, they're necessary. Thank you, Michael and Randy. Um, I know that we've just scratched the surface with all this. Um, so we'll leave it at that. But I want to thank everyone for joining us. And we hope so very much that you'll stick with us throughout this event, um, where some really exciting and necessary, to use your word, Randy, issues will be discussed very soon. Uh, so thanks for stick sticking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, I'm Amy Webb, Director of Business Programs and Partnerships at Americans for the Arts. So far, we've heard about the vast contributions 
both economically and socially of the arts and entertainment sector, as well as the dramatic impacts to these industries throughout the pandemic. Now we'll drill down a little more to hear about specific areas within the sector and how they've been impacted and are enterprising through it all. We're very fortunate to have incredible leaders in the field with us today sharing their insights. Kristen Sakota, Executive Director of Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, Joe Benincasa, President and CEO of the Actors Fund, and Mitch Glazier, Chairman and CEO of Recording Industry of America. Welcome to the panelists. So my first question for all of you is, what has been the primary way that the pandemic has negatively impacted your area of arts and entertainment? And can you share ways that have emerged to respond to that, especially considering the disproportionate impact to Black, Indigenous, and people of color, workers and businesses that we heard about in the previous presentation? So uh, why don't we start with Kristen? Hi, so first of all, thanks for having me and uh, good to be here with you all. Uh, as uh, Amy mentioned, I'm director of the LA County Department of Arts and Culture. And so we serve as the local arts agency for the largest county in the United States, which is Los Angeles County, a region of more than 10 million people, 88 different municipalities and over 100 unincorporated areas. I like to say diversity is one of our greatest assets and our field as well is very diverse. Um, we serve primarily the nonprofit arts sector as well as individuals um, and school districts as we work in grant funding for arts nonprofits, arts education, creative career pathways, commissioning artists for civic arts, doing research and fostering cultural equity and inclusion. What we have seen like so many others um, across the country and across the world was really a devastating impact um, to the region's arts, cultural and creative sector. In LA County, the arts and creative economy annually is more than $200 billion of economic output every year. And just the arts nonprofit sector that we serve annually has more than 13 million visits to the museums, the theaters, the arts centers, uh, the arts education programs. And so all of that was shut down pretty much immediately. And so after that in May, we saw not only everyone out of work, the venue shut down, layoffs occurring. We heard reporting that only 53% of the arts organizations felt confident that they would even survive the COVID pandemic. Now, of course, there were relief efforts um, and we uh, were so thankful to see those from across the field. Uh, everything from Music Cares to you know, uh, USA Artists and other arts relief fund, the Actors Fund, folks are with us here today. But we did see a lot of segmentation in the relief for the field. Uh, if you're an individual artist, go here. If you're in music, go there. And so what we hadn't seen at that time was something significant to support the nonprofit arts sector. We later then began to see foundations coming online like the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles and others. And so what we did uh, to address COVID impacts from the financial point of view was first of all, prioritize getting those grant dollars out. But second of all, we were able to access $12 million from the Federal CARES Act Fund uh, by the LA County elected officials had that allocated direct to arts nonprofits as part of a small business relief strategy and administered in LA County COVID-19 arts relief fund uh, for more than 300 organizations in the region. But I'll tell you, even administering the $12 million that was so critical and 83% of those organizations saying they were gonna use those dollars on payroll, the need in terms of the losses and unanticipated expenses that those 350, let's say, organizations uh, showed in their applications was greater than $230 million of need. So we can see that this pandemic uh, has been uh, just decimating the field in terms of activity and in terms of dollars and cash flow. Uh, and so that has been really a critical, critical need thus far. Um, we also have seen uh, of course, funders like us and in private philanthropy doing a few key things, increasing the amount of dollars and stretching to give more to the field. We're also seeing greater flexibility. We've had to allow arts organizations to uh, use dollars flexible, flexibly. And we've seen an increased focus on diversity, equity and inclusion, including in our work as well. 
So for us, 95% of those relief funds for equity went to small and mid-sized organizations as those are more likely to be the ones that are led by and serving black, indigenous and people of color communities and other vulnerable communities. Um, we also have just seen an increased uh, focus on equity overall. And this is critical because as we all know, we're dealing with a health pandemic, we're dealing with a resulting economic crisis, and we're dealing with the crisis straight on of racism and structural inequity. But all of those areas have seen the great reveal uh, and magnification of structural inequity and racism, whether you're talking about the disproportionate health impacts of communities uh, and folks uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID, the economic crisis and the unemployment uh, and the communities that are hit so hard and essential workers that have to put themselves at risk uh, and the small arts organizations that may be uh, serving or led by those communities, as well as straight on uh, structural issues and social issues. So we've got to keep all of those front and center as we think about this moment of not only relief, but also how we're gonna see recovery, systems change, resilience, and really reimagine the field uh, before us to preserve our cultural infrastructure uh, and, and create new ways that have cultural equity at the core. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, there's a lot to say uh, and, uh, and uh, pass it on. Well, I'll start, start you know, you know mention mention the, uh, the uh, so important what, what you're doing, Kristen, and we're so respectful of LA County's cultural commitment, you know, to the uh, arts. You know, the story of the Actors Fund in 2020 is about preparedness and responsiveness and action. You know, our national effort to help everyone in the performing arts and entertainment has been focused on direct financial assistance, health insurance, and the services embedded in the plans like mental health counseling, career services, and addressing racial inequities through our human service programs. And just a word about the Actors Fund. We're called the Actors Fund, but we serve everyone in the performing arts and entertainment. We partner with all of the charities that are serving the creative community, from Music Cares to Will Rogers to Motion Picture and Television Fund. So we're, we work very hard and very effectively together with these other charitable uh, charities. The, uh, the pandemic. You know, the Actors Fund provided over $18 million in emergency grants to almost 15,000 people around the country. That's at least nine times the amount we provide in an average year. And within that total, we were entrusted by 17 organizations to manage their relief funds. Of the people served, five of six came to the fund for the first time. And we expect the need to be greater this year. A secondary effect of the pandemic and the massive unemployment that followed was the loss of earn, earnings-based insurance coverage by entertainment union members, as well as the loss of private plans through the Affordable Care Act due to lost income. Many seniors faced the additional loss of their Medicare supplemental plans, which is just terrible. We were able to add insurance counselors through our Every Artist Insured program uh, to help hundreds of people navigate uh, their way through the complex insurance world to continue or sustain essential coverage. You know, as life changed, illness spread and the economy shut down, people in our community like every others began to feel the anxiety, depression and other mental health effects of a newly chaotic world. Our staff continued to provide our group education programs, supportive counseling, social media messaging around self-care, and a robust list of resources, information, and referrals. Our seniors residents in Englewood, New Jersey, thank God, has been COVID-free uh, since April, uh, which is a terrific testament to our administrator and the staff there. And more than a thousand artists who are living in our senior affordable and supportive residences in New York, Los Angeles, and uh, New Jersey, uh, have been living in a safe environment with quality services around them. You know, and more than 100,000 artists around the country have benefited from our programs, helping them to secure decent, affordable housing wherever they live, largely in urban arts areas. Racial justice. 
As we renewed our commitment to racial justice following the murder of George Floyd and so many others, we created a series of support groups and community forums, offering colleagues of color a safe space to be together and to process their experiences. These included sessions for adults generally and by gender, as well as sessions through the Looking Ahead program for black youth, LGBTQ youth, and parents. You know, the, the Actors Fund is fortunate and has benefited from advisors who have done deep dives into the organization. Staff has been engaged in a way so that organic change uh, is being made. Also, because our chairman is black, that's Brian Stokes Mitchell and a co-founder of Black Theatre United, also the great director of trustee Kenny Leon has helped us, and also Allison Wright, uh, the head of talent and HR for Netflix is working with our board uh, to create and to help us understand, you know, what is needed by the, uh, what we need to do to further uh, make, create a diverse organization from governance down to the people we serve. More than half of the 36,000 people we serve are black and brown. Uh, and our governance and the governance of the entertainment community isn't that, re isn't reflective of that. And we're determined to be very focused and deliberate and creating a very diverse uh, governance and organization. You know, we've re with regard to affordable housing, uh, which is a, a tremendous need for artists all over the country, uh, we've used, uh, we've been powered by the use of private investment in affordable housing tax credits and similar tax code created investment opportunities. And it's an important engine for development of more affordable housing around the country. Uh, the Actors Fund is actually two corporations. One is our charitable arm, the Actors Fund, and the second is the Actors Fund Housing Development Corporation. We are busy qualifying artists to live in tax credit financed affordable housing residences. Not only ones which we own, but those which are uh, built by other organizations like ArtSpace. The, uh, our, we, have an, we developed an income calculator uh, which is helping artists average their incomes over three, four years to really determine if in fact they are qualified for affordable housing that is made possible. I'm very proud that in 2020, we did a, a $34 million expansion and renovation of our nursing home, which combined private philanthropy of $14 million with a tax exempt bond you know, of $20 million. I'm also very proud that this month, we are uh, breaking ground on the Hollywood Arts Collective, 150 affordable units in downtown Hollywood. Uh, we've completed the financing of a $95 million project. We're gonna be raising more money. We're building a theater into this process, into this project, and also creating a home for certain legacy arts organizations in Los Angeles. Uh, we also completed a uh, renovation of our residence in, in uh, West Hollywood the Palm View residents, and it was a $10.4 million project. And we did that, we did it without one COVID infection. And it was complicated because we were moving people in and out of the facility on a regular basis. So we are committed uh, to collaboration. Everyone in the arts is committed to a collaborative um, way of working. The, the, the way the Actors Fund is approaching collaboration is partnering with government, partnering with private investors, and with philanthropists to do good for the arts community. And uh, I think that's the direction we're heading in. We do know that 2021 is gonna be incredibly challenging because our industry will be the last industry back, whether it's Broadway or on sound stages around the country. Uh, but I think that uh, with the help of good government and uh, the generous uh, smart philanthropy that's out there, I think we're going to be able to help the arts community come back to life in a probably a bigger and a better way. Well, thanks, Amy, for having us. And thank you, Kristen and Joe, for everything you're doing to help artists around the country. Um, the recording industry has, like the film industry, suffered greatly under the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. especially the live part of the industry. Um, where venues may not come back uh, even in 2021, uh, at least to a great extent. 
and artists who depend on live income so much for their sustenance. Um, the need at the macro level to fight for policies in Washington that will help people make it through so that we can continue to advance American culture and innovation in music is vitally important. And we worked with uh, local and state governments, with artist groups and others on the CARES Act to make sure that there was money that was set aside for those in the arts with their specific needs. And it's incredibly difficult because a lot of times these are folks who normally wouldn't qualify for regular unemployment benefits in their states because they're independent contractors. Uh, and if they do have a day job where they do get a W-2, that's a small part of their income, but they're only receiving unemployment based on that part of their income and not the other parts of their income. And so we work very hard with many groups to, in the current bill that just passed Congress as part of the last appropriation bill, to make sure that there's a mixed earner provision that allows a supplemental benefit for those who make a great part of their income, not from regular W-2 income, which was extraordinary. And another giant uh, piece of that bill for independent music venues and other venues around the country was the Save Our Stages Act, which put forth a $15 billion fund that independent venues that are really the cornerstone mm. of their communities um, can use in order to make it through. Otherwise, can you imagine when the country uh, is safe to reopen and all of those music venues that really form the place where you gather in a neighborhood, where you come together culturally as part of a community uh, and that add to what to our identity, basically, as Americans and the experiences that we have if all of them were closed. You know, you have iconic venues in DC like the 930 Club and in LA like the Troubadour. And I could go on and on listing venues in every single state, all of which are in grave danger. And if we lose them, we lose a key part of America. And so getting those funds put in and working with artist groups and the independent venues to, to get that uh, was incredibly important. And we have more to do. In the spring coming up, we've got to fight for more uh, appropriations for larger venues that are also in danger uh, and that provide the same sort of benefits uh, on a larger scale. So there's a lot of work to be done on the pandemic uh, and on relief going forward to help sustain the arts. And, you know, artists are the ones who are always the first responders in many ways during a pandemic. They're the ones who hold the fundraisers to raise money for disaster relief. They're the ones who raise money to make sure that grants can be uh, given to people uh, in all professions. And so I think it's important that we remember that we've got to be there for them too. Uh, and, you know, not everybody is a celebrity. Uh, there are a lot of hardworking artists out there uh, who need sustenance during this time. Uh, and I would just say on um, structural inequity, which uh, has become such an important uh, issue this year that both Kristen and Joe touched on, the music community um, uh, I believe has really sort of come forth with sustainable programs and plans, creation of new entities to make sure that inequity isn't just something that is a news topic for a day and goes away. Uh, but in the words of a couple of folks who started a movement at a label, the show must be paused uh, and people need to take a step back, look at structural inequities, both in our own companies, uh, in our um, disciplines, uh, and in society generally, and to figure out how they can contribute. Um, every record company has uh, initiated sustainable ongoing task forces. Uh, they have all put together uh, plans to address structural uh, inequities going forward. Uh, and importantly, new organizations like the Black Music Action Coalition have been developed to make sure that they have representation going forward at every level uh, so that a continuing discussion can be had. So it's not just a 2020 or a 2021 focus, but it's a sustainable focus that the arts can contribute to going forward. So uh, I, I think a lot of innovation has come out of uh, the pandemic. There have been um, uh, in streaming services uh, for music and for film, a lot of advancements. Those are sort of silver linings where there may be benefits that ultimately come out of this that help put them all forward. I'm hopeful that, you know, as people pull together out of all of this destruction, 
that the pandemic has caused, uh, that there will also be some silver linings and some benefits and technological advancements and ways for artists to reach their audiences, ways for us to reach each other like we're doing right now, uh, will continue to progress and those won't, won't just be flashing the pens either. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to be optimistic, uh, thankful for the aid that's been given, thankful for organizations like the Actors Fund uh, and LA County who uh, care so much and do so much to actually get funds out to people and continue to work together uh, and just not stop or forget until it's done. Thank you all for those remarks um, and for everything you're doing for the sector. We really need all of the power behind your organizations to help us get through this. Um, so this question is for Kristen and for Mitch. Uh, going back to what we heard earlier in the event about the interdependency between industries like bars and restaurants, like tourism, like small businesses with the arts, um, as well as what we know about its usefulness in addressing both civic and social issues. Can you speak to why the arts are central to healthy businesses and communities? Mitch, why don't we start with you? Yeah, you know, I, I think that a lot of economic estimates that are done for the arts really underrepresent the ripple effects that the arts have. If you think about real estate development, for example, there's a reason why when you build condos or apartments or a town center, why you want that music venue or that uh, or that you know cinema to be uh, an anchor in that community, and that's because that's what draws people there. That's what makes them want to come. Uh, it's those experiences and that feeling of community. And so what the arts provide to a community is community, right? Without the arts, you don't have that collective experience. And that intangible economic effect is essential to every bar and restaurant that's around there, uh, to uh, every developer uh, who wants to be able to, uh, to invest, to every single investor. And so um, I think that we underestimate the economic value of the arts. And once you realize how central the arts are to driving everything from, you know, technology to broadcast to community development, um, you start to then focus on how to make the arts more sustainable. I've never seen uh, any sector where the people who are a part of it have such a passion and probably, you know, since it's a calling would do it no matter what. But to take advantage of that and to not support the arts in a way that accurately reflects the economic impact that they have is not just unfair, it's also short-sighted. And I think there's a lot of really good economic reasons to invest in the arts. And so we're gonna continue to push with lots of other organizations to make sure that whether it's government partnerships uh, with the arts or private partnerships with the arts, that people understand the investment and that we try to accurately reflect the value that arts have to our economy. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think uh, Mitch has made some excellent points. And just to highlight the economic interdependence, uh, when I mentioned earlier that LA County has an arts and creative sector that is more than $207 billion of annual output, that includes both direct and indirect. Uh, employment, spending. So when folks go to the theater, when they go to the museum, they also then go to the restaurant. Uh, those folks are then employed there. They shop, they spend at the gift shop, uh, you know, they, they travel around. And so all of those things are connected just in terms of the economy. But there's more. You know, Mitch also talked about the, what I'll call the social impact of the arts or also the civic impact of the arts. We know that communities that have higher levels of cultural resources. So that's higher levels of artists in that community, of nonprofit arts organizations mm -hmm. in that community or arts businesses. Those communities show better outcomes in things like educational attainment, 
public safety and health outcomes in things like diabetes or obesity. And that's whether or not those individuals are even participating in the arts programs, that's at a community level. Um, and this has been proven in studies like the Social Impact of the Arts Project out of University of Pennsylvania. So we know that arts are really also a form of a public good, increasing vitality, increasing healthy neighborhoods. And this in turn helps support the business community. I would also just say that in addition to the arts and creative sector itself, uh, creativity is part of really the future of work across so many industries. So when we think about creativity, when we think about arts education or career pathways or creative youth development, those are things that are important for all youth, for all students, for all of us to have access to, not just as a form of charity, but as really what is part of education and essentially a workforce development effort to support uh, economic opportunity and to support innovation in the arts and creative industries, which are huge drivers uh, in our country, larger than construction and other, other uh, sectors, but also across all kinds of industries and areas. So there are so many ways that arts and business or arts and uh, economics and really arts and shared prosperity are connected in our communities. Thank you both. Um, Mitch, I love what you said about the um, arts providing um, uh, such an impact and that um, they bring communities together. That's what is community, right? Um, as well as the economic impact being underrepresented and underappreciated. And that's so true. And I think that, you know, um, when Kristen was talking about those ripple effects and really kind of quantifying that, it's our job to um, to really kind of shout that from the rooftops and make sure that people understand that interdependency between the arts and other and other sectors. Um, and Amy, if I could just add one other thing that I think it's just important to always say, especially when you have you know potentially a broad audience that may not themselves be in the arts, it's also important to always remember the arts. What we're talking about, artists or creative workers, arts administrators, museum workers, whatever that is work. So the arts also is employment. Arts also are businesses and even nonprofits doesn't mean they're not earning revenue. It just means they don't have shareholders. <laughs> uh, so all of that is really important to also know this is work. It's creative work. Uh, it's not just the person who uh, wants to kind of do it uh, on their own and a hobby. That's also incredibly important art making for community. But arts also is business and is employment. Absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out, Kristen. Um, so finally, we have a lightning round question. So in one minute or less, um, starting with Joe, what is the most, uh, the single most critical way the public and private sector can work together to equitably address the negative impacts to our creative ecosystem so that we can continue to thrive once we can safely resume work? Well, I think it's a good government combined with philanthropy and, uh, and, and, and just leadership within the arts community. Uh, but bringing all those things together, uh, I think it's incredibly important. And, you know, when I think about development, I'll just, let me go back quickly to development. Uh, we built a residence in downtown Brooklyn with the theater in it and a home for the Brooklyn Ballet. And that was like the pivotal thing to, turn around downtown Brooklyn. It brought 80 different nonprofit groups into the theater uh, to use. So I think, but we could not have done that without good uh, elected leadership by our elected officials, uh, good uh, private investment and good philanthropy. Now I have to also mention that, you know, I think Mitch, you mentioned this new era that I'm looking at, this live streaming. We just celebrated over three days, raised $2 million with TikTok, uh, with uh, Disney and with uh, a company called Seaview. We did a musical version created by TikTok performers, you know, uh, to raise money for the Actors Fund of Ratatouille. That that, that happened is amazing. Uh, so I think we're, we're looking at a, a new era for the arts. It's gonna exist in person. It's gotta exist in person, face to face, but it can also exist in a digital world. And I think we're just scratching the surface on this new digital world. I think one thing that we've learned uh, about partnership uh, with the COVID experience and policy is that uh, national, state, and local governments working together along with uh, agents, uh, uh, private agencies and public agencies to actually you know, translate those policies and those dollars 
to actual distribution to those in need is crucial. Uh, and you know, just looking at the mixed earner piece that I talked about earlier, states have to opt into that. Uh, so you know, Congress can make the money available, but the state has to opt in and agree to have a mechanism to distribute it. Uh, and then folks like Kristen who are on the ground uh, are key agents in connecting those dots to make sure that the dollars actually do their job. And so those partnerships are incredibly important uh, from you know, Washington to the state level, uh, down to the state uh, or down to the uh, county and city level. And I think groups like the Recording Academy have done an excellent job of trying to connect those dots, but we all have to do more to try to connect those dots. Otherwise policies without you know, active distribution are meaningless. And I'll just uh, add that, you know, to what's already been said, I believe in the silver lining and the idea of not wasting a crisis. So this moment of disruption does allow us the opportunity to move forward in new ways. And this gives us a chance to really redefine what it means to be a creative economy. And I think one of those things means thinking about it as a multifaceted ecosystem. It is fine and performing arts. It is nonprofit. It is creative workers. It also is the film and digital media industries, music, uh, and there are government and local agency actors as well. I think especially for our audience that might be coming from a, a chamber of commerce, I think there are specific things you can do that others can do as well. One, include arts, culture, and creative industries as part of your platform, your strategy, or one of your areas of focus so that partnerships in this area become a key uh, that matches really our power in the economy as well as our power in community and civic engagement make diversity, equity, and inclusion or anti-racism also an intentional part of your agenda, whether it's your board diversity or initiatives that you seek, because this has to be sustainable. That digital uh, you know, transformation happening has never been sustainable for, for example, the dance community or many artists organizations that uh, come from BIPOC backgrounds may not have the same access to fundraising or technology. And so how are we gonna make this sustainable uh, with a DEI lens? And then of course, uh, encouraging those public-private partnerships and advocating for the same at the public policy and funding levels at every level, federal, state, and local. All of that will make a huge difference in bringing this home to all of our communities. Uh, and I just wanna say one more thing, which is I, I'm sitting here in LA and we are one of the creative capitals of the nation with one of the largest hubs. I used to be in New York City, uh, which is also a cultural capital. And in fact, I took my daughter to that Brooklyn Ballet School uh, that Joe was talking about. Um, but there are artists and music venues and nonprofits and cultural uh, happenings in every community all over the country, rural, every state, city. And so wherever you are or wherever your chamber of commerce is, arts, culture, and creativity can be on your agenda. That's great. Um, thank you to my terrific panelists for sharing about your work and your insights into the future of our sector and how we can withstand this temporary setback. Um, you've left us with a lot to think about. Um, <laughs> Uh, and to the audience today for being with us. Thank you all. Um, enjoy the rest of the event. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good speaking with you guys. Bye-bye. Welcome to today's Small Business Panel. I'm Pam Bro, President and CEO of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, and I have the pleasure of moderating this segment. The importance of small businesses to America can't be underestimated, uh, particularly the importance of small businesses to our country's economy. Small businesses are the lifeblood of the U.S. economy, creating substantial jobs and driving innovation and competitiveness. Creative sector small businesses are a crucial part of this mix and their ability to recover, to renew and rebuild from the pandemic induced economic crisis is critical to our country's future. This panel will feature two speakers, a performing artist and entrepreneur, Tawana Hines, who is founder, CEO and president of Funky Brown Chick Incorporated 
and a member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We will also hear from Margaret Hunt, Executive Director of Colorado Creative Industries, which is a division of the Colorado Governor's Office of Economic Development and International Trade. And we will begin with Tawana, a Silver Syringe, Maryland performing artist and entrepreneur who has pivoted her line of business to virtual theater. Uh, welcome, Tawana. Welcome. You are a performing artist specializing in social impact entertainment, and you're an entrepreneur. How do these worlds come together in your small business? Absolutely. Creativity always matters. Whether we're talking about a small business releasing a new line of products or expanding their current line of business to add a second, third, or fourth, there's a lot of creativity, imagination, and bringing to life something that did not exist before. We see this in small business. We see this in the arts as well. And so creativity is such an important function of both business and the arts. And not only the creativity, but job function and job creation is important as well. As a performing artist, I have to hire audio people, lighting people, I have a speaking agent, speaking agent, I have a literary agent, and there are so many other people as well. And that's nothing to mention the people who are selling tickets at the theater itself, the people who are cleaning the theater, the marketing departments. And so I think the arts, just like any other small business, are important for creativity and job creation. Uh, thanks, Tawana. And you know, the COVID-19 crisis has impacted your firm and so many other firms, yet you've been able to successfully pivot your creative business. Can you tell us about your pivot? Absolutely. One of the things that I think we had a leg up about is we have, since the beginning, been a very digital firm. So whether I was writing for outlets like uh, NBC News, The Guardian, or any of the other people that I've written for, or performing at places like the arena stage. I was used to this idea that there was a digital component to it as well. Social media, promoting all of the activities that our firm was doing and me as an artist was doing as well. So there was always a digital component to our work. I think the thing that was interesting about performing theater in a virtual setting compared to an in-person setting is you don't know what you don't know. And I think many small businesses can relate to that. When you're faced with an unforeseen challenge, whether it's a virus, such as something biological, or whether it's something social, a change in consumer case, your product was of interest and now it just isn't as much. You have to be adaptable and we have to be able to change. When I performed my first live theater show with no audience, I didn't realize how much of a difference it makes with these faces in the theater, smiling back at you, laughing along as you say funny things on stage. We had an audience, we did very well for the show, but everyone was looking as you are now through a screen. And so I had to learn very quickly that you have to be adaptable. You have to be able to understand that there's something you just won't know until you start doing it. So it was great. It's been good to be able to pivot and continue performing as an artist, even without being in person. Well, uh, I'm delighted that your pivot is working. Uh, you know, there are many small business owners and creative business owners who may still be struggling. Uh, would you have some strategies you would recommend uh, they consider as they work toward their own pivots? Absolutely. I would say there's probably been three that are incredibly vital to sustaining any unexpected challenges. First, maintain your focus fall back on why did you get into the business in the first place? What are your core values? What is your mission? What are the ways in which you can still do all of those key things that are vital to you in new ways? It's possible that you can stay within the lines of business that you were currently working, just doing them in a different way. So maintaining your focus can take away a lot of the anxiety of feeling like, oh my goodness, I've got to start all over again. Not necessarily. Perhaps you're just starting in a different way. Perhaps you're doing the same different things in a different direction. So focus, I would say, is very vital. Second, 
I would say that you've got to be very comfortable with uncertainty. I think whether we're talking professionally or personally, not knowing what tomorrow will look like can feel very uncomfortable. And so instead of shying from that and pretending like it's not scary, face that straight in the eye and make sure that you understand that uncertainty is to be expected. Find strategies and ways of coping with uncertainty instead of avoiding it. And last but not least, find your community. Networking has never been more important. Smart, good ideas always have a market. So make sure that you're connecting with other small business owners, other artists, and other people in your communities that can support you, the work that you do, and help connect you with audiences who are looking for exactly the services and products that you provide. Well, that's all really sage advice. So Tawana, thanks first of all for your energy, uh, for the inspiration, and again, for, uh, for sharing strategies with our audience. Of course. And, and now uh, I'd like to hear from Margaret Hunt in Denver, Colorado. Uh, as the leader and the visionary behind Colorado Creative Industries, Margaret works at the intersection of economic development and creative industries development. And with a solid professional background uh, as an economic, development, uh, economic developer and an arts background, she brings a unique and important experiences uh, to her work. And so Margaret, welcome. Thank you, Pam. Nice to be here. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has certainly impacted small businesses and arts sector small businesses are no exception. Uh, can you begin by speaking to the impact on small arts businesses in Colorado and perhaps share an example or two of strategies that small sized arts businesses you're seeing are using for their own economic comebacks? Sure. Well, um, one example that is uh, just fresh in my mind because I just got off the call with the owner of a business. They were running a, um, a really successful music venue where they were um, also uh, producing um, uh, webinars and broadcast and virtual events. And they had employed a number of highly skilled technical sound engineers and lighting specialists and, and designers and um, I think is something around 16 individuals who are who are really at the top of their game in their craft. And when when the pandemic hit, um, of course, it forced the closure of that venue. Um, interestingly, they have continued to do their work in in new and innovative ways through online production. Um, they're also now working with the owner of the building who has agreed to um, uh, sell them the building um, and so we're working with them to help them find the um, financial tools um, uh, loans and grants to help them be able to move into this building permanently uh, and be the owners and uh, help them find uh, new sources of business um, for them to continue in this successful work because it's really important to us that we keep as many of our creative people in our state as possible. Prior to the pandemic, I should note that the growth in the creative sector in Colorado over the last 10 years has been around 25% in revenue and in jobs. So it's been in the top five leading employment sectors in the state. We don't wanna lose these creative people in our state because Creativity and Colorado go hand in hand, right? It's part of it's part of our DNA, if you will, um, as a state and as a people. And so, um, with a background in community and economic development, and also as an artist myself, I really this is a work of passion for me personally, and for the team in the governor's office to ensure that um, they have the tools that they need to um, be able to innovate. Uh, to be able to uh, uh, stay alive during this terrible time and to come out of this on the other end uh, with uh, new business opportunities and a new business model. Thanks so much for that, Margaret. 
Uh, given that many of our audience members are affiliated with Chambers of Commerce, and given your unique vantage point uh, in state government, could you please tell our audience how state Chambers of Commerce can strengthen their relationships with state arts agencies and their own arts communities? I know that's happening uh, in Colorado, and I think our audience would appreciate uh, some guidance there. Well, I think one of the one of the interesting things that we've done in the governor's office is that we are holding regularly regular monthly calls with our state chambers and all of our members, um, local chambers, um, directly with the governor and with our team, um, so that for us as a government agency, as a state agency that continues to try to identify the needs of our communities that we're working hand in hand with our local chambers um, and hearing directly from them about the issues and concerns that they have at the local level. And so, um, you know, it, sometimes some very interesting opportunities present themselves during these calls, right? And so one very small chamber in a very remote part of the state um, was interested in initiating a, um, a mural movement. And they, um, they had a lot of questions about how do you hire an artist? What kinds of agreements do you have to have with your business owners in your community? What if the business sells and um, uh, they don't, the new business owner doesn't want the mural on the, side of their, on the side of their building any longer? And so we've been working with chambers to help them help put together a toolkit for them to address um, this sort of it's, it's been an amazing um, grassroots movement, mural movement across our state. Not only, not only because uh, communities want to build community pride, they want to get people downtown shopping again and dining in the restaurants, um, but they've also been responding to the, to, uh, the crisis of the pandemic, wanting to um, put up uh, murals of hope for their frontline healthcare workers and to um, thank them and give them credit for the great work that they're doing. Um, we've also seen um, a, a movement around Black, the Black Lives Matter movement. So in response to that, and um, so we've begun documenting with uh, the help of um, a graduate student at a local university, who the artists are who are doing the work, where these murals are taking place across the, the state what, what are the stories behind them so that we can provide this kind of information to our local chambers of commerce so they can use this as a point of inspiration in um, fostering greater growth in their business community by bringing the community together through the arts. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. And thanks so much to both of you, to both Tawana and Margaret for sharing small business comeback strategies and guidance with us today. So I'm Rick Wade, Vice President, Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing someone who really needs no introduction. He's often called the most electrifying bass player in the world, a consummate entertainment whose primary goal is to ignite and excite his audience, intelligent, articulate, charismatic, great friend of mine for many, many years, the most outrageously stylish bass guitarist with a lot of flair for the extraordinary, Mr. Verdine White, often called the ultimate fire of earth, wind, and fire. Verdine, hey, man. Hey, hey, Rick, how are you? How have you been? How are you doing? I'm good. It's good to see you, and thank you for joining us for this conversation and a starring role as we look at arts and entertainment in the pandemic era. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I, you know, we might want to tell the audience that, uh, you know, we are great friends. We met many years ago, so this is not our first time, you know? That's right. And let, let me let me be clear. I hope you see my set. I had to dig back in my memorabilia box and create the 60s, 70s uh, room that I grew up in. Right. Uh, eight track tape player. Right. Uh, the old mustard colored clock and phone 
that right. painting and some that vinyl back all of our kitchen. <laughs> you, you got some vinyl back there too, right? That's right. <laughs> the vinyl's coming back too. It's, it's coming back. It's coming back. That really vinyl, was, that you was know? it. Listen, let's jump right in because I know we have limited time. I've been looking for the conversation. You know, the Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, a, 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 a an institution in itself representing an era of music that right. really is known about love and, and peace and bringing people of all ages, races, and religions together. Right. What's sustained Earth, Wind, and Fire over the years? And is that an accurate depiction? Well, of uh, well you, know, you know, I think what sustained us, first of all, is by the grace of God. You know, we have to thank my brother Maurice White, uh, the founder, the leader uh, for... Uh, uh, putting this to group together and with myself, of course, and Philip Bailey and Ralph Johnson, and we carried on the mantle. So I think, and we have five generations of, of uh, people that come hear our music. And of course, every minute and 15 seconds, there's an Earth, Wind & Fire song being played somewhere in the world. Yeah. You know, we think about uh, then and how you, uh, over the years, and, and now uh, here in 2021, uh, uh, 2020, uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, now unprecedented political political partisanship, attacks on the, our democracy, the COVID-19 pandemic, and incidentally, uh, obviously I'm aware of the loss of your brother. I've lost two aunts back to back. Right. Home. These have been some really difficult and stressful times. And and right. it's been said that uh, music is universal. It soothes the soul. Is that accurate? And what have you been doing uh, to help soothe your soul and the soul what? of others? I've had a chance to like really think it through. And, and of course, you know, you know, we've been doing our thing, you know, we've had a chance to, uh, we did a Christmas record with Megan Trainer. Uh, we did a couple of great things uh, this year. So uh, we've stayed active, you know what I mean? You know, uh, as a group, you know what I mean? We've been lending our hands. Uh, I'm part uh, of the Music Artist Coalition with my good friend and manager Irving Azoff and uh, Susan Jenko. Uh, you know, they're doing a lot of great work for artists and I'm part of it and proud to be part of it. And then. Uh, I have the Virginia White Performing Arts Center that was originally a brainchild of my wife's on 4700 in Avalon, where we give free food every Wednesday, drive-bys, uh, and uh, and we were doing it before the pandemic. So I think what, what it is, we're all doing our part. You know, I think in me listening to some of the other uh, uh, people talk today and other artists talk, and uh, and yourself included, of course, uh, you know, I think we all have to do our part the best way we can. That's right. And, you know, uh, people may not know, obviously, we all know you were born in Chicago right. and raised there, but your father, uh, Dr. Uh, Verdine uh, White Singer, was actually a physician. Right. And so I imagine as we, we deal with the challenges uh, that have disproportionately affected Black Americans and other people of color around the pandemic, that, that you see this in a really interesting, broader construct. Obviously, you had lost. We all have seen or know someone who right. suffered. But any thoughts on uh, the pandemic and, and, and how you... Uh, have sought to navigate it during this difficult time? Well, we've all had to navigate. I think it's something that we've all had to make it up as we go along day by day. Uh, don't forget this came out of nowhere for all of us. So there was no playbook, you know, even all the way down for us doing interviews like this. Uh, but actually it's a good way to see you, you know? And uh, well, I think we've all had to navigate and be creative and make it up as we go along. And my, and my dad being a doctor out of Chicago, being an urban doctor, we had to work in the in the urban community. You know, we had to work uh, many times for free, you know what I mean, uh, with patients and things like that. So I think uh, a lot of times with our first responders, you know, uh, everybody is uh, doing their part and have to go back to the basics, you know. And there's, as I said earlier, there's no playbook. So uh, we learned a lot from our father about that, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, as a, I'm obviously uh, very proud to say I grew up in the era of earth, wind and fire. Uh -huh. and you know, you think of songs like September, personal right. to me, because my birthday is September 1st. All right. Tell us something about Earth, Wind & Fire that perhaps uh, people may not know. I mean, any I'm just curious about any thoughts about uh, something unique or interesting about Earth, Wind & Fire, your journey that we may not know. Well, of course, you know, it's 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 been a great journey and a long journey. Uh, uh, we were very lucky, you know, we were lucky that we came along at the right time and the right music and, and, uh, and, and, and culturally we've been part of the, the mix musically, uh, uh, behind the scenes as well, as we talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, people of color in the, in the industry, you know, we're proud to say that myself and Philip and Ralph, you know, uh, we have a, a tremendous amount of people of color in our organization, from stage management to production management, and we've been doing this for many, many years. You know, 
And uh, and when you came to the show in Tokyo, you didn't get a chance to come backstage and right. saw our staff. If you saw our staff, we have wonderful people. So we've been trying to do our part. And so I think those are the things that they don't know about us until they meet us and, and spend some time with us. Yeah, and you raise a good point. I mean, this is a you're you're an artist, but you're a business. You hire people. That's and right. You think about the pandemic averting. We did a survey of black and minority owned businesses and found sadly that some 66 percent are concerned about permanently closing. Some stats so that show that 41 percent of black businesses have already closed. And, you right. know, as you just referenced, these are not just businesses, but these are jobs. Uh, how has the pandemic affected Earth, Wind and Fire uh, as a business and then further uh, black artists? Uh, well, we, we were very lucky that don't forget that we have a name value. So, you know what I mean? So we have uh, an opportunity to do things, you know what I mean? To, uh, and our brand is a worldwide brand. So uh, in that way, you know, we get a chance to withstand some of the pressure of the pandemic. And, uh, and I think every artist, from what I understand, uh, they, they're all being creative, you know what I mean? They all are faced with the same things, venues closing, things like that. And so, but I think as before, the artists are always on the front line, you know, uh, uh, trying to help out. The artists are always the first in, in benefits and in, in, in raising money and things like that. So uh, uh, I got to hand my hat off to a lot of the other artists as well, you know. Good. You know, we, uh, in, in, in panel early in the chamber has uh -huh. been meeting uh, and working with Congress and administration on making sure that the stimulus funding, uh, payroll protection program, et cetera, uh, it, it makes sure it's inclusive of, of the arts and entertainment industries and music venues. And thank goodness there's sort of a set aside for live right. venues. What, what else can we do at the U.S. Chamber and as business leaders to help support the music industry? Broadly? I think, but I think what would be great uh, to reach out to the music industry and ask what they need. You know, very few, a lot of times people don't know that the people in the music industry are hardworking people. This is a community. You know, we live in Los Angeles, but it's not red carpets every night. These are people that go to work every day. They go to studios, you know, they're recording, they're producing, they're working very hard. So I think if you could get a think tank together where you get out, get a chance to really sit down and ask the artists what they need, what's going on in the industry. A lot of people just look at us through you know, red carpets and Grammys and Oscars and things like that. But these people are, are hardworking people. So I think if you ask them what do they need, they can actually give the ideas of what they need. Yeah, that's a really interesting point in mm -hmm. about seeing the world and seeing business and seeing music through the lens and eyes of you, an artist. And I think about, again, when I yeah. grew up in the era of vinyl, technology has transformed the way we live, we work, we play, and even listen to music. Right. Some digital content is king. And but if you had a crystal ball and you really and you could look, which I know you can because I know your vision. Uh, <laughs> what what does the future of music uh, and music venues look like uh, even post pandemic? I think post pandemic, when it comes back, people are going to come out in droves. They're going to come back. They're going to bring their, their kids. They're going to bring their families. And right behind you, you've got you've got vinyl back there, Rick. And and vinyl has made a comeback. <laughs> You have a you have a whole new generation that's never experienced vinyl. So you know we're going to see more vinyl. You know I think we're going to see a more uh, inclusive of all the different technologies. You know that fits everybody's taste. That's that's what I see in my crystal ball. Got it. Uh, some of the other previous conversations have all touched on the issue of racial inequality. We launched right. a whole national agenda at the chamber called Equality of Opportunity, trying right. to close race gaps. Right. And, you how is the industry doing in general uh, with regards to progress and equity in the music industry? Well, as I spoke about before, you know, the Music Artists Coalition that I'm part of, that addresses it. Uh, you're talking about the, the Black Coalition is being addressed. Uh, as I said before, you know, in our organization, we have a lot of people of color, you know what I mean, in our organization, you know, from stage management to accounting, you know, uh, road management, things like that. So. We are proud of the fact of it is that we've been doing the work, you know what I mean? And as I said before, you didn't get a chance to come backstage to see us. If you saw, if you came backstage, you would see a lot of people that look like you. So I think the more that uh, the artists and the people uh, uh, take the initiative, you have to take the initiative, you know? And uh, and I think that's what I see. Yeah, you know, for our audience, uh, uh, Bernie keeps referencing coming backstage. This is a quick story. In 2009, uh, I was... <laughs> with then Secretary of Commerce Gary Locke to Tokyo, Japan, and I'm right. walking in the lobby and somebody says, Rick Wade! And right. it was, it was Bernie and his team, and they were kind enough to invite us to one of their shows. And we were proud, obviously, uh, traveling around the world 
uh, as we advocate for business and industry to see Earth, Wind and Fire is not just the U.S. Uh, a band, a group, but your message is truly global and universal. Right, right. And and we met, of course, in Chicago uh, several years ago. And but you had to come to J Japan to see us. So. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see you again live and in person, my friend. Absolutely. I can't wait. You you, you know, uh, uh, some say uh, that we're in a new, there will be a new normal. There certainly would be an other side when we right. think of the pandemic. Right. Will we ever be back to normal? I mean, families have lost loved ones, jobs. Some jobs may never come back. Right. What What does getting back to normal mean mean to you? I think I think that remains to be seen, but but I am hopeful. The fact of it is that that we are having conversations like this. I think uh, uh, we will figure it out. There's there's a there's light at the end of this long tunnel, as I as I say all the time, and uh, so I think I think we're going to be okay. I really think we're going to be good. You know what I mean? It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be hard work, but I think if we roll our sleeves up and really go for it, you know, I think we're going to be okay. You know, uh, you you are a, a very optimistic and positive, and I, I think you are deliberate in, in being optimistic and such a visionary. But I'm curious to ask you, if, if you will, what activities do you engage in to stay healthy, to stay hopeful, to have fun, uh, to remain so optimistic? Uh, books you read, any music you listen to other than that of Earth, Wind, and Fire? I just yeah, well, I, well, you know, you know, I still listen to great music, of course. People like Miles Davis and things like that, and and uh, and now the younger people are turning me on to people like Tyler, the creator and all of those uh, those great artists. And also to keeping a positive outlook as much as you can, you know, uh, exercising, you know, keeping your mind right. Because that, that's a big thing in this pandemic, reaching out to people, saying hello, uh, checking on people, checking in with people, because there's a lot of people who are by themselves. They have nobody to speak to. So I think that 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 has a lot to do with it, too. And, and, uh, and I've been doing a lot of that. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, we have to uh, place as much uh, priority on our mental health uh, as we do our physical uh, well-being right. in these difficult times. And I do think that music plays such a role, important role in the work that you do and so many other artists. Absolutely. Yeah, with us just talking, you know, you know, we've had a chance to have a, a few conversations and that's always been uh, fun. Just to talk and kind of catch up a little bit, you know, uh, normally would, you know, we're so busy that we wouldn't have the opportunity to kind of kick it. You know what I mean? So I've been grateful for that, you know. Yeah. And, you know, my final question, you know, I could talk to you all day long. I know. We, Rick, we've got to do this again. We, we, I'm trying, we're trying to get so much in, but, but we got to we got to have an hour. We got to have you and I got to have an hour. We, we, we certainly would do that. And put some more records up in the back back there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we're going to play some Earth, Wind and Fire music. So That's we good. We move, man. So here, here's, here's my last question. You touched on something about young artists. Uh, we work a lot. I work a lot with historically black colleges and universities and young people in trying to inspire the next generation of business leaders. Uh, but if you had a what is your message to a, a, aspiring young artists as you, uh, you could give them the, the guidance and advice and wisdom, the kind of uh, advice that has sustained Earth, Wind and Fire over the years? Well, your advice, I think, first of all, it starts with the hard work. You know, it starts with knowing what you're doing, keep doing it, and also to ownership. I think ownership is the key. You know, own yourself, you know what I mean? Because don't forget, as we talked about earlier, this is a business that goes on and on and on, you know? Well, listen, there is a reason uh, that you oftentimes refer to as the ultimate fire of, of, <laughs> Earth, <laughs> of Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, your, your, your constant motion, your enthusiasm, your energy, uh, to the point of disbelief to some. Uh, and, and I just want to thank you for taking time uh, to speak to us this afternoon. And, and, and we are prayerful uh, for the music industry and for business and economy and for us coming together uh, as a country, as one country during these difficult times. And you play such an important role in that. Well, thank you so much, Rick. And we have to do this again, all righty? Well, we certainly look forward. Thank you again, my, my good friend, Irving White. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Narek Rome, and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs in Arts Education at Americans for the Arts. Thank you for tuning in today for the arts and entertainment in the pandemic era event this afternoon. 
We are thrilled to be working with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, and the National Endowment for the Arts to bring this program to you today. As we've discussed in the program, the arts and entertainment sectors are an incredibly powerful economic driver, which we measure in part with studies like the Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account at the Bureau of Economic Analysis and our very own Arts and Economic Prosperity Study. But beyond these studies, there are ways that are more difficult to measure but greatly impact our daily lives, whether that be patronizing a creative business, attending a live arts performance or local festival, watching a film, listening to a song, or noticing how the arts are baked into our everyday community life. Because of the unique experience of the creative sector, mainly being an in-person experience, our workforce, like others, has been shut down due to the grave dangers presented by the pandemic. We hope that the shutdown will end in 2021 so that the financial recovery can begin. Last summer, as part of the advocacy taking place, 204 chambers of commerce authored and signed a letter to Congress in support of the arts, arts agencies, and increased federal relief funding and policies to support the sector. And we are so very thankful for this advocacy. As we look ahead towards a period of recovery, we will be trying to work with local councils of government and chambers of commerce to improve some of the local comprehensive economic strategies uh, that are taking place locally. These may be familiar to you, the processes at the local level, and please know that local arts agencies and state arts agencies uh, are happy to participate in this process. Some of the policies that we believe will help the sector that just were finalized uh, are things like the second draw of the Paycheck Protection Program, which has already shown to provide over $13 billion to the creative sector uh, and more is needed. And we're happy about the inclusion of the Save Our Stages provisions and $15 billion for live entertainment venues. And we're also excited about the continued eligibility for creative workers in all of their individual and independent forms of work. Americans for the Arts has recently developed a national proposal called Putting Creative Workers to Work, uh, along with over 100 partners in crafting this proposal. It's a 16-point 16 po 16 policy proposal that is written for the new administration uh, to outline what measures can be taken at a local, state, and federal level to support the sector at large through this prolonged recovery period. It's been endorsed by over 2,200 arts and creative companies and workers and shared with members of Congress and the incoming administration. You can learn more about that proposal in the follow-up resources sent after this event. So thank you so very much for joining us today. And please know that Americans for the Arts, the nation's local arts agencies and state arts agencies are your local partners in economic and community development. I now like to introduce my colleague, Pam Bro, the CEO of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Pam? Thanks so much, Narek, and hello, everyone. Today, we've explored the social and economic contributions of the creative sector. We've also explored the disproportionate impacts of the COVID economy on the sector, with far too many closures and job losses and the compounding crises on BIPOC creative workers and businesses. Champions for the arts and creative sector are at work in states and at the federal level, recommending policy solutions and resources for the sector's comeback. You've heard that from Narek as well. As these discussions continue, it's important to remember that the arts and creative sector can improve the health of the broader economy. We've seen this happen during prior economic downturns. The arts offer economic diversification and other qualities that make it a valuable asset as we seek a path forward from the current economic crisis. For rural communities, arts employment per capita tends to boost overall employment more strongly in rural areas than in urban areas. This is a meaningful benefit, given that rural communities historically tend to take longer to rebound from recessions. Regardless of the size of a community, the arts are a part of the solution. 
It's clear that no single approach can solve an economic problem of the scale we're all experiencing. Multiple responses are certainly needed to reactivate and rebuild our economy. And the arts have a constructive role to play in that array of strategies. To help you understand more about how the arts contribute to a recovering economy, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies is releasing new research and case studies on this issue. And we hope you'll find them both enlightening and beneficial. It's been an honor to work with the partners who presented today's program, the US Chamber of Commerce, Global Innovation Policy Center, the National Endowment for the Arts, Americans for the Arts, and the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies will soon make materials and all the research referenced today available to you. So please keep an eye out for it. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.